There would be a price to pay for this idealised Ireland, but would it not all be worth it? As a country, had we not been a mere servant in Britain's mansion, our servility rewarded with occasional comforts. Now we would forgo those comforts and opt for liberty in the simple surroundings of our own cottage, sharing what we had and free to live our frugal lives our own way. So the theory went. And the route map to that was a policy cocktail of nationalism, quasi-socialism and Catholic social teaching, drawing on anything from left-wing manifestos to papal encyclicals. The message went out that we couldn't afford international living standards for some, while others had no work. Public wages would be cut and we would share a frugal life until all who were willing could earn their daily bread. On the land, we would free the mass of small farmers from dependence on the ranchers who bought their cattle for fattening on their better land before selling it at market. Tillage would free the small man and free the country from expensive imports of foods like wheat. We would feed ourselves from the resources of our own land, and that would mean work. Better that a man and his son would plough and harrow, sow and reap, than that a few cattle should browse the land. Their grain would feed the mills by government edict, and again that would produce jobs. Irish-made flour would go to the bakeries, literally producing our own daily bread, even if it was dearer. And in time, people would get used to its odd colour, not pure white like the imported stuff. Freed from imports, we will grow by honest toil and the fruits of our own labours. In the new scheme of things, it was the families of the little farms of the West who would come into their own at last. Tillage would be their escape from the cunning and parasitic dealers at the fairs, so the theory went. But old ways die hard, and in general the government's exhortations and even expensive schemes to get people to till the land, while temporarily tried, didn't lure many permanently away from their traditional production of cattle. And of those who did make the change, it was yet again the big farmer, not the 30-acre man, who gained. After all, he had the better land. In an economic war, all the better if the horsepower didn't need imported oils. The determination was that every home resource would be put to work. So down came great beech, oaks and pines to supply timber, which in turn would produce the beams and planks for homes and furniture, replacing the imports now locked out by the tariffs. And while the saws worked here, elsewhere hundreds of men were at work planting the new forests, which would supply later generations. The great economic and cultural experiment was underway, striving for a vision of a people and a country, sturdy sons and daughters of the soil, content with the simple things of life. The second strong arm of the economy would be new industry, and preferably Irish-owned. Too much here was owned by foreigners, Dev lamented, and our new industry would be sited around the countryside to spread the jobs. But private enterprise was cautious of its capital, unsure of the new thinking in this new order. So the state stepped in to do at least part of the job itself. Board Namona would harness the bogs, hard work with only simple machines, but giving valuable jobs, which would see new villages rise up too. The sugar company grew to capitalise on a new unfamiliar crop in the drive for tillage, sugar beet, and that too brought jobs on the farm, in transport and in the factory. But if government was involved, then so too were politics. Where a factory would be sited, whether owned by the state or by private investors, was now a political matter. 
Common Nangail, the first government, had steered clear of that, leaving it to business considerations. But it was the Fianna Fáil cabinet which decided where the new sugar factories would go on social and presumably political grounds. Their chosen course was to sprinkle them around the country, one each for Mallow and for Thurlis, and one for Tume, where at the sod-turning ceremony Mr de Valera boasted that the government had been determined that the West would get its share of the new jobs in state industry. However, soon the Department of Agriculture was bemoaning the fact that geography and not business had brought that factory to Tume, and it hadn't proved a success. Few politicians were qualified to pronounce on arcane matters like tariffs, capital, technology. But they understood the political dividends of locating a new factory in an area. And since foreign industry needed government permission to establish here, their location too was in the government's gift. They could be directed to areas of greatest need, political or otherwise. Sean Lamass decided to set up five distilleries to produce industrial alcohol, which petrol companies would be forced to use. It would mean more expensive fuel, but it would use up 400,000 tonnes of potatoes a year and employ 750 workers. But by 1940, all five plants faced major difficulties, not least being the supply of potatoes. Seven years after they had been approved by the cabinet, they used only 1% of the potatoes we produced. Costs soared and the product was sold to oil companies at six times the price of petrol. The saga was the worst example of self-sufficiency and decentralization ever undertaken, with the civil servant saying it would have been cheaper to give the 400,000 tons of potatoes free to the poor and then put 750 men on public health works at 30 shillings a week and they would still have saved nearly half a million pounds on the whole sorry episode. With more success, the men of Arigna mined their area's coal to warm many a hearth for which might have gone cold for lack of British coal now on the other side of a war tariff. The further your factory from Dublin, the better deal you'd get from the government. Dunlops ended up in Cork as the lesser of two evils. They were told by the government it was Cork or trouble. The building supply firm Brooks Thomas were urged to set up a plant in Bandon County, Cork, despite their pleas that it would be an impossible centre for their business with much higher costs. A Welsh tannery firm wanted to set up in business near the several shoe firms which operated in Drogheda. They were told no, they'd have their choice of Tralee, Sligo, New Ross or Portlaw in County Waterford. Every town and village vied for its share, discovering a new world in lobbying. Development committees mushroomed, each pressing their claims and invoking the memory of a golden age of busy mills in the last century. The new economic nationalism would see the wheels turn again. Hackettstown in County Carlow, for instance, once boasted two tanneries, and now it had Michael Barry, brother of the boy martyr Kevin, as it was put, 